right, well, welcome to TEDx. Good morning. I am so excited to be here to talk about my favorite topic. I'm going to ask you all to take a moment to close your eyes and go on an imaginary field trip with me. We're going to get in my time machine. We're going back to a moment in time in our prehistoric timeline where women were experiencing an adaptive mutation that would ensure the survival of the species. And that mutation is called menopause. Now, we are not unique in our ability to go through menopause. In fact, there are five other mammals in the animal kingdom who go through menopause, and they are all whales. Pilot whales, there's two different pilot whales, orcas, belugas, narwhals. So why did we develop this ability, this unique talent, as one would say, to go through menopause? Well, we have to think about these women back in prehistoric times. My guess, and what most of us believe, is that women probably had children until an elder age. We don't know what that age was, but there's a good chance that they died in childbirth, and that, as a result, their children would most likely die. Well, if we're talking about survival of the species, that is not going to work. So a mutation happened. Nature has a way of fixing itself. But at some point, women had this mutation that put them into infertility at an earlier age. So they stopped being able to have children. That ensured that they could take care of their children and probably their grandchildren, hence better survival of the species. Well, lucky for us women, this mutation stuck and became the norm. There is not one woman, if she lives long enough, who is going to be able to get through life without going through menopause. We are all going to get there. Now, there are people trying to hack the system, and I can tell you that right now there are researchers all around the world who are trying to figure out ways to stop menopause or delay menopause from happening. And I'll tell you something, they're not far off, and wouldn't that be great? I always said that I'm going to start a podcast, and that podcast is going to be when the menopause doctor starts to go through menopause, because guess what? I've been talking to women for the past, I don't know, 24 years about menopause and sexual function. I got this down, I've done all the research, I've written papers, I've heard all the talks, I've been on the talk shows, I've done it all, and I thought I knew it all until I started going through it. And it's a real wake-up call for all of us. And so here's the thing. We understand why women went through this, right? It was an advantageous mutation. Well, let's move forward, millennium, millennium, we're getting back in our time machine, and now we're moving forward to the 1900s. In the year 1900, the average life expectancy for a woman was 48 years old. So many of those women didn't even reach menopause. Menopause, on average, as far as recorded history goes, happens around the age of 51. The average age is 51. Okay, so 51. So we now fast forward 122 years. I know we're jumping all over the timeline here, but follow me on this. 122 years to 2022, where the CDC tells us that the lifespan for women is now 80 years old. We went from 48 to 80 in a little over a century. How did that happen? Better nutrition, antibiotics, better maternal health, better disease prevention. We're living longer, we're living stronger. Isn't that amazing for women? Is it amazing? <laughs> well, if you think about it, what happens to a woman's body after menopause? So when we go through menopause, our ovaries stop working. We run out of eggs. Our ovaries do not produce estrogen and, for the most part, testosterone anymore. What do we see happening? We see an increase in heart disease. Our LDL increases. Our blood pressure increases. We get higher rates of type 2 diabetes. We get weight gain in areas that we never had weight gain before, and it's really hard to get rid of. Our bones become brittle. We start to get osteopenia and then osteoporosis. We get traumatic bone fractures later in life that for some women can be life-threatening. We get a decline in our cognitive function. Cancer rates increase. Am I like selling this for anyone? <laughs> is anyone up for this idea of hacking menopause and stopping menopause? Well, the reality is, is that we took a misstep in 2002. We have an effective treatment for the majority of symptoms of menopause. We have a treatment that decreases all cause mortality, all causes of death in women. We have a treatment that helps with preventing type 2 diabetes diabetes, helping those diet interventions be more effective. That treatment is called hormone replacement therapy. And in 2002, 
the WHI put out a study that basically said hormones were essentially poison to a woman. It would increase your risk of heart disease, your risk of cancer, your risk of blood clotting, your risk of stroke. That study, unfortunately, was done in the wrong population. They looked at women who were, on average, 63 years old. What's the age of women who go through menopause? It's in their 40s and 50s. It's not in their 60s. Those women were already set up for those problems. We also used a different type of hormone. It was synthetic. It wasn't bioidentical. It was oral, not transdermal. Now we favor the transdermal applications uh, and not the oral. And we prefer bioidentical. So we have figured out a way to live better, happier lives after menopause, except for one area. And what is that area? It's our sexual function. And why is that? So let's again go back in time, in that time machine, back to our ancestors' days. This is the dirty little trick that nature played on women. So when women went through menopause back then, again, we are animals just like any other. Most animals do not have sex for recreation. They have sex for procreation, to have children. Back then, it was probably the same thing for humans. Once we went through menopause, stopped being able to have kids, we would raise the kids, and maybe our age-matched male partner back then would find a younger, more fertile female to procreate with, likely. We don't know for sure, but that's what we think is the case. Well, unfortunately, over the millennia, Sex has changed for humans. We now have sex for recreation. We have sex for our relationship. We have sex because it makes us feel good. We have sex because it makes our partner feel good. We have sex because it's part of our femininity. There's so many different reasons besides having children that women have sex, and women want to continue that after they go through the menopause transition. Now, I've had patients come to my office and say to me, well, if nature's telling us not to have sex, then I'm just not going to have sex anymore. That's fine. You can do whatever you want with your sex life. That's what's great about having free will. But most women are in relationships with male partners, and your age-matched male partner is not going through that same sexual decline that you are. I mean, now in modern days, unfortunately, erectile dysfunction is a very real thing for men, but there's a pill for that. But that libido stays elevated. And so I will have patients come in with their husbands, with their male partners, and the female will say, can you please tell, I'm going to say husband, can you please tell my husband that it's okay that I don't have a sex drive and explain to him why I don't want to have sex anymore. And you just see the male sitting there and listening and listening, and then the male looks at me, and this is, this is across the board, but I still want to have sex, but I still love my partner, and I think she's beautiful, and I still want to be with her, and it's important for the relationship and all of those things. That is a very important message that I pass on to my patients. I know that that spontaneous sex drive that you had when you were in your 20s, 30s, and 40s teenager is gone. But most women will experience something called responsive sexual desire after menopause. That means that we don't often go into a sexual act because it's Tuesday, the wind blew, you know, I'm looking at my partner get out of the shower and wow, doesn't he look amazing, let's have sex. That's not the motivation. The motivation is that there's an incentive, and that is incentive is I want to make my partner feel good, I know it's good for the relationship, and I know if I have sex, I'm going to feel good. Even though really what I want to be doing is watching Netflix right now. <laughs> that is something that's a very common message that I hear from my patients. So women will get into a sexual act, and if all the stars align, the kids are out of the bedroom, the pets are out of the bed, the door is locked, you know, I'm feeling good about my body image today, I worked out, and, you know, I'm not thinking about like, what I'm going to make for dinner tomorrow or you know, what the kids are going to get for lunch or you know, all this noise that we have going through our head. If that isn't there, we accept a, a sexual stimulus, it feels good, and guess what? During the act, we develop spontaneous, or we develop not spontaneous, but responsive desire. We then come out of that sexual act going, well, that was great, I love that, why don't I do that more often? But guess what, the next night, that's not there. So we have a lot of conversations about how do you build intimacy, relationship intimacy, and have sex. And sex can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it doesn't matter if you're in a relationship with a male partner or a female partner. After menopause, it's gonna take a little bit of work for your sex to be enjoyable and satisfactory and pleasurable, but it's worth it. So let's talk about what happens. We talked about low libido that's mostly related to a decline in testosterone. Does testosterone therapy work? So everybody asks, can I be on testosterone to improve my sex life? And the answer is, 
Yes, testosterone is used. It is often the endorsed treatment for postmenopausal women, but guess what? It only increases a satisfactory sex, like a, you'll have one extra sexually satisfying event per month with testosterone therapy. It is not gonna change the world. It is not gonna make you feel like you did when you were younger. You're not gonna wanna have sex all the time unless your levels are too high, which they shouldn't be. It's gonna make you think about it a little more. It's gonna make you more receptive and you might enjoy it a little bit more. It's a modest improvement. Why is that? Take two computers, one has one button and it says sex. One has one button and it says sex and it's surrounded by 100 other buttons that say family, kids, life, finances, stress, job, blah, 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 blah. Women, we wanna have it all, we wanna do it all. But what that means is that we have all these stresses in our life. So we have to learn how to filter out as many of these stresses as we can to have a happy and enjoyable sex life. So that means choosing to be sexually active when your partner, when you're not exhausted. So finding a time where you and your partner, whether it's setting an alarm and waking up early before the kids wake up, or getting in bed at the same time every night. Men and women are working, women are in C-suites, they're working hard, they're working late into the night on their devices, or they're doing stuff for their kids, schools, whatever it is. We don't always go to bed at the same time, so sex isn't happening. Or if we get into bed, we're so exhausted, we put on TV with our partner, one is snoring, the other one is like up late into the night wondering why aren't we having sex. Get the TVs, get the external stimuli out of the room. When we are in a sexual event with our partner, we need to be mindful. Anybody heard of sexual mindfulness? That's where when we start to feel our minds going to other places, we bring it back to the moment. We focus on our partner's breathing. We look at a point on the wall and we focus on that point on the wall. We experience everything happening to our body. It's okay if you wander off, just come back in, be in the moment. Make sure you're taking time to be intimate with your partner in, a, in an emotional way. Remember to say the I love, you's, I love you's. Remember to say the I appreciate you for X. Remember to kiss your partner for 10 seconds a day. I ask every single patient, when was the last time you made out with your long-term partner, the majority of patients say, well, we never do that. We'll give each other a peck on the lips. We don't make out. We should be getting back to a place where we are making out with our partners, kissing for at least 10 seconds a day. That takes time. Now, everything I'm talking about is in the setting of a strong relationship. If there are relationship issues going on, those need to be addressed, and sometimes with the help of an outside um, support, like a therapist. But with all things being equal, these are the things that we need to be working on. So getting out on date nights, really important. And there are certain things that are off the table. No talking about the kids, no talking about the job. You're talking about each other, things that you want to do, dreams that you have together. Take up a sport or activity together. Have sex in other places in the bedroom. If you can, have sex in the kitchen, have sex in the shower, have sex in your backyard as long as you have privacy. Get out of the norm. Increasing sexual novelty, bringing sexual novelty into the relationship is important. So after menopause, women will say, I have difficulty achieving orgasm, and if I get it, it's much weaker than it used to be. That has to do with that decrease in, in estrogen to the genitalia. So what can you do? Number one, talk to your doctor about vaginal estrogen therapy. Brings back blood flow and lubrication to the vagina. Sex won't be painful anymore. Use a silicone-based lubricant when you have sex, not a water-based. Water paste dries out too early. What, so silicone-based and oil-based are the best thing you can do for your vagina when you have sex. But sexual novelty, I call them sexual devices, AKA vibrators. Vibrators are really important for women after menopause. I've had patients say to me, I'm afraid that my husband is gonna feel uncomfortable if I use a vibrator, or it's gonna make him feel uncomfortable. The answer is that most men have done research on this, actually love bringing in vibrators into the bedroom, and that will help you achieve orgasm. The last thing I'm gonna leave you with is this concept of before play. So many women, remember we talked about spontaneous desire versus responsive desire. Most women after menopause have responsive. You can create responsive desire before your partner even comes in the room. Reading something erotic, watching something erotic, self-stimulation, watching a romantic movie, taking a bath with candles, putting yourself in the moment, can increase that desire, right? Now, you're not going into a sexual event at ground zero and waiting for your partner to get you to where you wanna be and they're already done. So now you can be on equal footing. So think about this idea of before play. 
super important. I'm not saying that every single woman after menopause has to have sex. They don't, they don't if they don't want to. But if they want to, they can. Never settle for, well, I guess I went through menopause and it's over. You can have a beautiful, amazing, satisfactory sex life. And when sex is good in the relationship, the, the research is there on this, when sex is good in a relationship and happening in a relationship, in whatever shape and form that takes, the relationship is actually stronger. So I just want you all to walk away from today saying life does not end after menopause. From a health perspective, we can live better, stronger, greater lives after menopause. Think of J-Lo at the Super Bowl. We can all be that strong, empowered, beautiful, sexy woman. So here's to the next third of our lives, ladies. May it be our best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leah.